Hello and welcome to another episode of Real Talk Friends. This is our special Easter treat to the world. I know. I'm so grateful to do this today. We're I can't, excited. I can't wait. Thank we you. We have John Hilton here and I'm so grateful. Do we say John Hilton the third? John Hilton's great. Okay. I like that there's a third though. Oh, thank you. I know. Okay. I feel like we need to call him Sir John Hilton the third. Okay, it just sounds so regal. The whole episode. Are yeah. you fine with being called Sir? You can just call me JH3. That's fine. Oh, JH3. JH3. Whoa. Gamer tag. I like it. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> We are pretty excited. Like we're acting really professional on camera right now, but inside Scott and I are are like <laughs> giddy for this. Yes. yes. Do you want to read the official intro? Yeah, let's do a quick intro so you know uh, who John is if you don't already. So John Hilton the third. So he was born in San Francisco, but grew up in Seattle. He served a mission in Denver and has a bachelor bachelor's degree from BYU. Uh, while there, he met his wife Lainey. The typical love story. We love those. <laughs> and they have six children. Uh, this is something interesting, John. I didn't know how much you've traveled. You've lived in Boise, Boston, Miami, Mexico, Jerusalem, and China. Currently, you live here in Utah. You have a master's degree from Harvard and a PhD from BYU, both in education, and are a professor of religious education at BYU. John's also published several books. This is what we're primarily having him on to talk about, is considering the cross. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna spend most of our day talking about. And so we'll definitely get into that. Um, let's see, you also speak at Education Week, which is where probably a lot of people know you from. Um, and your education research has influenced policy both in the United States and international, internationally. So you also like doing humanitarian work, learning Chinese, performing magic, and snowboarding. <laughs> And then I also found out mix. in fourth grade, you won the Young Author Award. <laughs> and you know what else is another so fun fact? If you follow John on social media, I love how your family dabbles in food from all those places you've been mm. and even more. Like, I do love to eat. I always feel like... <laughs> Our menu is boring when I see John's post because yeah. I'm like, oh, we're not having that at all. You know, <laughs> the other day you posted something and I was like, wow, it was just all the representation. I think it was for Chinese New Year. Yeah. Yeah. It's just celebrating the Lunar New Year recently. Yeah. Well, we are excited to have you here and we we wanted to kind of start out with your testimony about Jesus Christ. Usually we kind of end with that. But the why for this most recent project of yours, Considering the Cross, the why for Real Talk is to bring people to Christ. And I think it just invites the, the tone of this conversation if we lead out with Him. So do you wanna share your feelings and thoughts about Christ and what He means to you personally? I would love to. I remember in a recent uh, Real Talk with Friends episode with Anthony Sweat, you talked something about along the lines of how we have tended sometimes to have a focus on the church is true. And mm -hmm. if you think of a stereotypical testimony of a child, it's I want to bear my testimony, I know the church is true. And that probably would have been the center of my testimony for many years. You know, I'll focus on, well, in my church, we have the word of wisdom and these types of things. And I definitely do know that the church is true. But in recent years, my testimony has become much more focused on Jesus Christ. And President Nelson, I think, has been pointing us so heavily in that direction, even before his uh, becoming president of the church. A few years ago, he gave an invitation to study everything in the topical guide about Jesus Christ. And that uh, was a really powerful experience for me. And I want to testify to you and to our friends who are here that I know Jesus Christ lives. I am 100% certain in his living reality and how much he cares about each one of us. And because of that, every other challenge or concern or problem that we have in our lives ultimately is gonna be resolved. And I think that's actually one of the things that is interesting to me if you read section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which we focus on is the degrees of glory. Each degree of glory connects with the testimony of Jesus, either I don't receive the testimony of Jesus, or I'm not valiant in the testimony of Jesus, or those in the celestial that kingdom is really receive cool. the testimony of Jesus. So it, I don't know, I, I love the focus, and as President Nelson said, for Latter-day Saints, Jesus Christ is joy. I really believe that. And, and thank you for that. I think what leads perfectly into diving mm -hmm. into the conversation we wanna have about the book today is that invitation from President Nelson led you to studying and asking questions, which is always where revelatory relationship experiences happen, right? So thank you for testifying and inviting the Spirit Right, right from the mm -hmm. beginning about this conversation that we want to have today about the cross, about yeah. the Savior. 
it felt very necessary to start that way after reading your book is we need to start right with the savior and let's and let's take it from there and expand out but with this book john like reading this book it's it's obvious in the very first few chapters that a book like this does not come about in a few weeks or a few months or even a year this is not like a this is not a quick process and some books come kind of do flow that way but this one has considerable research done a lot of um his, some history in there that's really well done um what can you tell us a little bit about the backstory and i know gainaline kind of alluded to to some of this but will you tell us a little bit about the backstory of how this came about because honestly i went through because I, I started laughing when i was reading all the acknowledgements if i didn't <laughs> lose count or if i counted correctly you named 93 people by name Meaning, like, and, and I forgot some people, but too. I'm sure you did. <laughs> so. And there's others that you put in there, like your editing team and some right. others that you know. So, well over 100 people contributed, even though your name's on this. This is definitely a very, you know, a, collabor a collaborative effort that you've taken part in this journey. So, anyway, back to my question is can you tell us a little bit about the backstory and where this started from there to where we can now just pick up what you've given us and read it? So about four years ago, I moved to Jerusalem and I was going to be teaching for a year at the BYU Jerusalem Center. So I was up in Galilee doing some field trip prep before the students arrived. And you know, we're just, me and a few other professors were chatting about some different things. And I can still like picture where I was walking down the hill. And one of my fellow professors said to me, John, why do you think in the church we always focus on Gethsemane as the place where Christ atoned for our sins? And to me, I was kind of like, well, just because that's what's true and that's the only thing that matters. And, and I realized in that moment that in my teaching, whenever I taught about the atonement, I focused a lot on Gethsemane. I focused a lot on the resurrection, but I, I didn't really focus on Calvary. And that question my friend asked kind of launched me on a discovery of trying to look at, okay, well, what exactly have the scriptures taught about Gethsemane and Calvary? And what did Joseph Smith teach? And let's kind of get beyond like the, the one sentence answers that I'm used to hearing and really dive deep. And so you're right, I did have a team of research assistants that helped look at, you know, exhaustively, what does every talk given in general conference and the journal of discourses have to say? And also at the same time, I'm living in Jerusalem and so Christianity is a major religion in Jerusalem and there's crosses everywhere and all the churches we were at. And the symbol that honestly for me growing up, I had kind of maybe had a little bit of a negative feel towards like the an cross. Aversion? Like an mm -hmm. aversion's the perfect word. You know, I, I didn't hate it, but it's sort of like, ooh, that's a little different. I started to see how other Christians felt about it. And let me just tell you this, this uh, story real quick. So I'm, I'm at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which for many Christians is the most sacred place in all of Christianity, where many people believe that Jesus died and was resurrected. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a different church than Latter-day Saints are used to. And I'd been there with some Latter-day Saints who had this kind of feeling of like, oh, this is creepy, it's kind of dark, and there's all these crosses, what is this? Um, but I was meeting a Catholic friend there. She was from America and was traveling to Jerusalem. And when I got to her, she was at this one part uh, where there's a traditional place where Christ's body was anointed and tears were just streaming down her cheeks. And she's clearly having one of the most spiritual experiences of her life. And I realized I had been here with some friends recently and no been one. like, oh, that's different. You know, like we don't. And I realized, you know, there's some beauty that I have completely missed out on, and I wanna learn more about it. I would say that that's what stood out to me in reading the book, and, and I didn't just read it, I feel like I've devoured it. <laughs> <laughs> and my family's like, we know. Cause I'm like, and I just read this. You did the same thing. Paige was work, and I'm like, Paige, you got to hear this. I think by the she's like, can I work while I was reading it? Yeah. Was your tone of humility? Mm -hmm. You wrote it with that. As much as you're an expert and you bring, um, you know, degrees and experience and teaching with you, I, I love that you take the reader through this humble acknowledgement of the aversion and the curiosity that is, we love to say here, is mm -hmm. more expansive. Mm -hmm. And it invites the reader. Um, specifically, I love the chapter where you really dive, I think it's chapter seven, into the crucifixion and the science behind that mm. and the history behind that. And you're like, if you're feeling that aversion, you use another word and you wanna skip over this chapter, I invite you strongly not 
to do that. <laughs> and so I really appreciate as a writer, your style in taking us through your own development with a relationship with the cross. Did you, do you feel like you want to share any of the resistance that you met? Because this question was so, I was so happy that we were going to get to ask you this, that the birthing of a book is a long mm. process. Can you shed any light on maybe some of the opposition that you faced or, or, or what has pushed it through to this point? Because I really felt like we should just rejoice that it's in print. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to. And, and let me just jump around on a couple okay. of things. So you mentioned chapter seven, which focuses on what archaeology and history can teach about crucifixion. That's another one where in Jerusalem, I realized everything I knew about the crucifixion was based on paintings or movie I watched. And, yeah. and like, there's got to be science behind this. And actually, scholars have researched and written hundreds and hundreds of pages about it. And it's one of those things where once you start digging in, probably some of our, our friends who are watching today are thinking to themselves, well, why were the thieves tied to the cross, but Jesus was nailed? And that's coming from the Harry Anderson mm -hmm. painting that's in the gospel art kit. And of course, that's not based on science. And or people were both tied and nailed at different times. And certainly we have no data that the thieves that day were tied to the cross. But it just goes to show how a lot of times, and this is not just true for the crucifixion, for lots of things. Like we just grow up, we hear something, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so when you talked about resistance, uh, one of the kind of narrative pieces, this goes back to the core question my friend asked is, why do we focus on Gethsemane so much? I was kind of curious to empirically find out, is that true? So I, once I was back from Jerusalem, I surveyed several hundred Latter-day Saints and asked them the question, where would you say, although Christ's atonement was a process, where would you say Christ mostly atoned for our sins, Gethsemane or Calvary? And 88% of people selected Gethsemane with only 12% saying Calvary. And you might say, well, that's, that's kind of a trick question. Like, what, it, what if you gave them a third option of both? And was it you and Anthony that did uh -huh, this? Anthony <laughs> Sweat and I. Um, and, and our, our, another colleague, Scott Esplin, was the one who said, well, you should ask, ask the same third. question, but add a third equally. Mm -hmm. And when we did, still a majority of people selected Gethsemane only. And these are, for the most part, return missionary, Latter-day Saints. And it just kind of speaks to there's a narrative of Christ suffered for our sins in Gethsemane. And that's where it really took place. And the cross was you know, good and important, but the real power of the atonement was in Gethsemane. I think that's kind of a narrative that a lot of people have. And what I learned was that while the scriptures talk on two occasions about Jesus suffering for our sins in Gethsemane, there's more than 50 times that they talk about Christ dying for our sins. Joseph Smith never talks about Jesus suffering for our sins in Gethsemane in his sermons and teachings, but several times he talks about Christ dying for our sins. And it's the same trend if you look collectively at all of the presidents of the church, for example, for every one statement like Christ suffered for our sins in Gethsemane, there's more than 10 saying Christ died for our sins on the cross. So there's this heavy emphasis in our scriptures and by our church leaders on the atoning significance on Calvary that I had totally missed. And so it, it, going back to the opposition, as I started to kind of share this and kind of test this out with people, there was some resistance. I remember one time I shared this, it was at EFY, I shared it with a group of EFY teachers at a lunch. And one of them just looked at me and said, what are your motives? You know, like, kind of like, are you trying to destroy the atonement or the church? Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, my motive here is to come closer to Jesus Christ because President Faust said that any increase in our understanding of his atoning sacrifice, whether that's Gethsemane, Calvary, the resurrection, any increase is going to draw us closer to him. And I realized that at least for me, and it may be different for others, there was this major area of Christ's atonement that I just hadn't studied. I'd almost ignored. So what I hear you saying is that we have a cultural versus doctrine versus policy problem. And as you were approaching this, you could see that from a cultural standpoint, you had, you had been either there was a void of cross you know, paraphernalia information and discussion in church meetings or in homes for you. And that's so widespread mm. that it was not doctrinally based because the discussion around the death of Christ is plentiful. Right. But the cultural 
interpretation of the death of Christ doesn't translate into a uh, comfortable around the cross, so to speak. And that's a really important distinction is that the cross as a symbol and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ are two totally different situations. Like the symbol of the cross has ebbed and flowed across the centuries of Christianity and even in the decades of the church. But the doctrinal significance of Christ's crucifixion, Paul says it's the thing of first importance has not changed and that and that bears out. So I was talking to another person about this and I said, did you know the Bible really emphasizes the crucifixion? And he said, well, thank heavens for the restoration scripture that emphasizes Gethsemane. And this was a pretty smart person. And you were and like, I said, well, a actually, actually. <laughs> you know, you look at Nephi, King Benjamin, mm -hmm. Abinadi, Lehi, Jacob. I mean, everyone is talking about was Christ's crucifixion. Was it 20 verses in the DNC in the Pearl Great Price alone, right? Right. I think that's quoting you back to me. So. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Check my sources in your own book. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think the idea is that because of maybe an aversion to the cross or just the lack of the cross or a general feeling, I'm confident that a lot of people watching this maybe couldn't point to a specific quote or teaching, but just in their minds kind of feel like, ooh, I, I got a little bit of a bad feeling about the crucifixion or the cross. I, I don't know why, but I don't think we do that. And a lot of times people will quote from President Hinckley's 1975 talk where he said, for us, the cross is a symbol of the dying Christ, but we worship the living Christ. Mm -hmm. And we can talk more about that quote if, if we want to later. Yes. But, but I think the, the point of it is whatever the cross symbolizes is one thing, but that's a totally separate issue from the literally hundreds of prophetic statements that have talked about Christ dying for our sins. So when people say, well, Jesus suffered for our sins, he overcame spiritual death in Gethsemane, and he overcame physical death on the cross, mm -hmm. and they bifurcate it, Elder Gerald Lunn called that a doctrinal error. So that's just yeah. not scripturally accurate. And one of the things before maybe we move on that mm -hmm. I loved in the book is you share a picture of one, the 1852 cover of the Doctrine and Covenants, which we're studying this year, mm -hmm. and it has a cross. Right. Right, right on, on the spine. On the right spine. On it has spine. one at the top and one on the bottom. Yeah. And maybe we'll post that picture with yeah. this episode if if we can, or at least anyway, but that, that was fascinating to me. I, I hope we don't leave this part of it, but that we just interweave more of the questions that we have for you, because I think this is the core of why it's such a timely project to have come out, that it's addressing the doctrine, the policy, and the culture around the cross for us as Christians. And and I appreciate that you, know, you kind of tackle it from all the angles, and it causes the reader to stop and go, uh, I don't know. I don't know why I feel that way. You know, I don't know why I've had this. Isn't there a teaching? Isn't there something that told mm -hmm. us that we're not supposed to? Is this why it's not on our churches? It's this is why we don't wear it generally as a culture, as jewelry. And, and so I appreciate that. Well, and maybe if we could just touch on that for a minute, what are some of the historical things that you found? Because that's what you start chapter one with. Uh, chapter one, part of it's to answer this question. By the way, I loved how you formatted the book. Mm. That beginning, the introduction, do not skip the introduction. Do not. Because it, I love how each chapter answers a question. Mm. And I love that because I feel like that's one of the things I love. I, I've loved giving people sacrament talk assignments in the forms of questions and saying, here's mm. a talk, give a talk, or here's a general conference talk, talk about repentance, rather than how has repentance enhanced your relationship with Christ or mm. something. So that teaching style really resonates with me. So this question, if however much you wanna, you wanna answer this, but it's your own question for chapter one. <laughs> We're just gonna quote John yeah. to John. No, it's just, I'm like, why should I come up with the same thing? So no. you just said, is the tendency many church members have of avoiding the cross based on official church doctrine, or is it more of a cultural practice? So if you could speak to that just a little bit about the history of the cross, and, a, and then specifically in our faith. So, it, and that would probably, I think it, this might be the longest chapter in the book, actually, mm -hmm. even though the book is centered on the crucifixion, not the cross. But to kind of give a brief answer, it's interesting that across the centuries of Christianity, Christians themselves have had a debate about what does the cross mean. In about the year 800 AD, there's a recorded uh, kind of dialogue between some Christian monks who really felt that a cross was important and it was important to have Christ on the cross, whereas a bishop felt like it was all idolatry. And a lot of people aren't aware that that was the same with the Catholic and Protestant mm -hmm. debates. Mm -hmm. So in the 16 and 1700s, for example, Puritans who are traveling to the American continent completely abhorred 
the image of the cross. The cross was not a common Christian symbol in 1700. It was a Catholic symbol. And that actually becomes really important because as Joseph Smith is growing up and we hear about all these different religions, mm -hmm. have you ever noticed when you go back to the Joseph Smith story, he never talks about the Catholic Church. He doesn't say the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Catholics. Right. Yeah, that's no, true. the Catholic Church was very small in America at that time. In fact, in 1820, there were about 200 Catholic churches in all of America and only five in the entire state of New York. And Baptist churches and Methodist churches, of which there were thousands, did not use the cross as an image. So Richard Bushman points out that as Joseph Smith is growing up and he's thinking about churches, he doesn't consciously reject the image of a cross. It's just not part of his cultural context. It's not something that Protestants do. And so when the church moves west, it's actually with hundreds of thousands of Catholics migrating to America, primarily between the you know, 1840s, 50s, 60s. By the time you get to the 1870s, there's now a Catholic church is common. And in fact, there's documentary evidence from the 1870s that by that point, the cross is a Christian symbol. It's no longer denominational. But the Latter-day Saints are in Utah. They're kind of so they're even isolated own. even more from right. any exposure to it. So if you hear someone say, you know, like, oh, that's a Catholic thing, that might that might have been true in the 1850s or 1820s, but certainly is not true by the late 1800s. And so where it becomes, in fact, one uh, quote from the 1870s, a person talks about how the cross unites Christians together. And I think that, like you brought that up, it, it's an important Christian symbol. Whatever, however our faith chooses to use or not use the cross, it's important to realize that for most Christians, it does represent the living Christ. It represents Christ who they believe is resurrected, just like we do. Do you want to comment on the Ensign Peak? I think that piece of history, the Ensign Peak monument for me, mm -hmm. I think gives a definitive statement about it, we don't have to have an aversion. Yeah, so um, this is a great question. Uh, I mean, along the way, if you were to look at photographs from the late 1800s, there's photographs of Latter-day Saints wearing cross necklaces or cross earrings. And this was in a time when photographs weren't common, right? So people are choosing what to wear to pose for a formal photograph. So the cross certainly wasn't taboo, and it's the Ensign Peak monument that I think gives us the best, I don't know, evidence of that. So Ensign Peak in Salt Lake City, it's a prominent location and the presiding bishop approaches the first presidency in 1916 and says, what if we put a cross on there to embolize our Christianity? Christianity. And first presidency passes off on it, says, this is a great idea. And the Desert News publishes an article and says, we're showing that we're a Christian, mm -hmm. just like other Christians, we believe in this. And there were some opposition, some Jewish people objected and said, well, you know, we're not just one faith here in Salt Lake City. The interfaith community was mm -hmm. concerned. And even some members of the church who, oh. are, who can be read as saying at that time, oh, well, the cross is a Catholic symbol, which was factually incorrect. But anyways, interesting to see what people were perceiving at Their that biases. time. Their yeah. biases. Yeah. And the bottom line is eventually the, the project was canceled. So they didn't put a cross on Ensign Peak. But the fact that the president of the church, mm -hmm. Joseph F. Smith says, yeah, this is a great idea. It just gives you a sense that historically there wasn't maybe the aversion that we might have thought has always been a part of the church. So John, I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's provocative to consider that um, that opens the door for maybe those that are like, oh, I'm hesitant. Is John causing a revolution to begin, <laughs> right? And I have had personal comments. I wear a cross and, and I just started maybe a year and a half ago. And because of what I do, I've had a lot of social mm. media outreach asking me about it. Maybe some positive, some negative. Some positive, some negative. So the positive usually comes from my interfaith base of, of mm. people I interact with. Um, I have a lot of not members of our faith that buy my faith-based books, knowing that that's my lens. Mm. And it's caused for me an opportunity to have missionary conversations. And you mentioned others in the book that, that their why and maybe wearing across and I just recently had another conversation with someone that is in an executive position and it caused them to stop and go wait wait your your cross necklace can I wear one and I was like well there's a book coming out <laughs> so if you have some issues about it but it's fostered some great conversations 
Some people have asked, you know, that I'm teaching false doctrine by my wardrobe choices. And it's allowed me to say um, some of the things and why is for me in wearing it. Do you want to comment on kind of the modern approach? We've talked some history here, yeah. but what you're finding and what you found in working with, with this book about where we're at today. So, and this is a good opportunity to be really clear about what I am saying and what I'm not saying. So I, I am certainly not saying that everyone needs to go out and buy a cross. Right. And you know, I'm not asking you to link your cross necklace uh, to every, you know, so everyone can get the exact same one. But I am really concerned about people being criticized who choose to wear a cross. Mm -hmm. So if we look historically, there's never been a prophetic statement where a prophet has said, do not wear crosses, do not display crosses. Can't, can't find it. So that's more of a cultural tradition. And there are a couple of times where we could see people speaking about it in a discouraging way, like it would be in poor taste for Latter-day Saints to do this. But we can also find lots of times where people have said Latter-day Saints shouldn't drink caffeinated soft drinks. And honestly, when I was growing up to drink a Coke, it was super bad. It was one step from vodka. And I, I'm embarrassed to say how much I judge people in different situations if they drank a Coke. And then I find out like the church comes down and says, hey, this, isn't, this isn't a sin. I'm like, what? This blew my mind. <laughs> and I think maybe we have a little bit of the same thing happening with the image of the cross where there's a cultural thing that's happening. I, I have a student right now and she shared how she parked her car at the Institute and she has a cross in her car and someone wrote her a nasty note saying, why are you parked at the, inst she had an Institute sticker on her car. Mm -hmm. She's like, Institute sticker, cross in your car, pick one. What? Wow. What? This is real talk. So I want to just pause on that for a minute because I think that's exactly why it's so relevant. You know, as you were talking, I was feeling the emotion of why I made the decision a year and a half ago. I needed I was in a place where I was like, I need to know my Savior in a different way. I don't know what that's going to look like. But every day when I put on this little necklace, that's very kind of understated. Um, it will be another reminder for me to return to that why in my day. When my day gets filled up with all these other things that are the thick of thin things, so to speak, right? So that was my why. And as you were talking about that institute student or just in general wearing it, I could feel that renewal of, I, I'm not fully like wardrobe committed for the rest of my life. But at this point, I knew why it was gonna foster a feeling inside of me that I wanted to keep nurturing. But for some people, it, it fosters a feeling of negativity. And I think that's, the hope is that we could celebrate. That doesn't mean that I need to start wearing a cross but my hope is that we don't criticize mm -hmm. others who do. In fact, I had a student who was in a similar situation to you. She felt like her testimony was weakening. She wanted to cling to Jesus. She made of this little homemade cross necklace that she felt proud of and it was connected for her. And one of her relatives saw her post about it on social media and said, why are you celebrating Christ's murder? Like shame on you. Mm -hmm. And it was so hurtful and I think it all kind of went down to a misunderstanding of the symbol of the cross. And to, to kind of go back to what we said earlier, the cross is a symbol. It represents something. And if you love it or hate it, that's, I it's mean, a, that, it's a it's symbol. A symbol. Mm -hmm. The focus is Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so if, if I have an aversion to the symbol, great, don't use it, but don't have an aversion to the event of Christ's crucifixion, because that is doctrinally powerful and life-changing. And if for some reason the cross is a positive reminder to you of Christ's atoning sacrifice, great. We shouldn't have an aversion to people wearing it. That should not feel uncomfortable. When I was a missionary, maybe if I would have seen someone wearing a cross necklace, I might have thought, oh, you know, that's, maybe that's the other. But if I were a missionary today, I'd be so excited. I'd go up to them and be like, hey. I'm you're, a Christian too. I'm a Christian. <laughs> I've got this book, the Book of Mormon, and in it, Jesus himself said, my father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. Can I share with you more about this book? Like, I can see we have something in common because it's huge. It's a huge thing that we have in common. You talk about that bridge building a little bit, and so mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Well, and I was just going to say that's where it shifted for me because I would have been someone who would have judged someone else um, and said, hey, choose You've been one. judging Gaina Lindley. Like, yes, this whole time. I've been waiting for this opportunity to say. We're going to do it right on camera. <laughs> on camera. Here we go. No, but... 
on my mission, I went to Detroit and I spent the first part out in the suburbs, but then um, I spent the middle part of my mission in the city. And our district, we had a district center and it was an old Greek Orthodox church mm. and there were crosses all over it. Um, not crucifixes, but crosses. In fact, if you were to take the building and look at it from a bird's eye view and look down, Different. it's in the shape of a cross. Uh, interesting. And so that really, I mean, we would sit, in, you would sit in sacrament meeting, watch someone speak. And I think if I remember right, I'd have to go look at my letters. I think I could just look around and see 20 crosses. Huh. And that made a huge, and, and now that you're talking about it, I think that really um, shifted. Because when I was in Detroit, I was a lot more like that that you just talked about. Hey, we will, yeah, we love the cross. Let's talk about hmm. the, re let's talk about 3rd Nephi 11. We read that when Jesus introduces himself in 3rd Nephi 11, he says that he was lifted up on the cross and did the will of the Father and being able to use that verse to connect with those people made a lot of sense. And I think I kind of faded away from that after I got out of the city, hmm. but it was really interesting being going to church every Sunday, seeing those. Anyway, so one of the things I wanted to that I wanted to bring up, um, let's shift gears just a little. Um, you make a distinction in your book between the living Christ and the loving Christ. And I thought this was really a useful way of looking at it. Can you explain this uh, a little bit to our audience, why the distinction and why you feel this is important? Well, first of all, let's be really clear. I know that I do and you focus on the living Christ. Mm -hmm. We absolutely worship the living Christ. And I think that sometimes we use that phrase or focus on it so much, it almost can be exclusionary. I only focus on the living Christ. Jesus himself defined his greatest act of love as his crucifixion. He said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's his definition. And maybe one of the most famous scripture. Yeah. Oft quoted, right? Yep. And, and Jesus himself, on more than a dozen occasions, talks specifically about his death. And in many instances, the atoning significance of it. So it's intensely personal and important to him. And just like anything, right? If there's someone you wanna connect with and they love bowling, you're gonna learn something about bowling. You wanna connect with them on their topic. And we're going through the Doctrine and Covenants right now. How many times have we seen already Jesus say something like, behold, I am Jesus who was crucified. It's, it's how he identifies himself. And so thinking about that phrase, the living Christ, and how Christ defines his crucifixion as his greatest act of love reminds me that we also worship a loving Christ. And it's not an either or, it's not, well, do I worship the living or the loving Christ? Because you can't have one without the other. Without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And without the resurrection, none of this matters. And so I love that the Savior is big and encompassing and we can worship the living and the loving Christ. And I think you really make a point in multiple places to say, focusing in this book on the cross isn't pushing out Gethsemane, mm -hmm. just like it's not eliminating the resurrection or his ministry. It's encompassing of all. So if you wanna draw closer to Christ, a bigger picture of who he is, it is helpful. Right. And fosters that connection that you talked about. Especially where there's so much about it in scripture and teachings of church leaders that maybe we've just kind of glossed over because I have this mental frame of, oh, that's not an important part or that's a lesser part or that's a different part. I don't know, it's kind of low hanging fruit to yeah. find out more about a key aspect of the Savior's ministry. Well, and I was gonna say, this is a, something and our viewers who have watched this for a long time will understand where I'm coming from with this. Um, this book for me um, has been, I put it right in the top of, of the books that have opened my eyes, my heart um, to spiritual experiences with the Savior. It really has facilitated mm. that for me. I mean, it's for me though, the other two are Jesus the Christ, the infinite atonement. And so this, that's where, for me, that's where I would put this. John, and that's wow, that good is company. High, that's high praise. And I mean that, and, here, and I'm gonna you. tell you why, because I'm gonna connect a thought that I, that I is, it is, it is the core part of my testimony with what you're saying. And I didn't realize why it was so deep until I read your book, and that is this. Um, one of the main, about a few years ago, like Gainalyn talking with her cross, a, about the same time, I was in a similar situation where I just needed more connection. I needed a depth that I didn't have because I felt like I was, you know, I was just, just, I don't know what the right word is, vulnerable, overly vulnerable, overly exposed to just stuff going on in the world. Anyway, and so when you talked about the loving Christ, it was evidence to me, and the way I say it is, when, when I've studied 
the suffering of Christ, it teaches me that if he suffered like that for me, that must mean I'm worth something. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's where I come up with this phrase, I am worth saving. And our viewers have heard, heard us talk about that all the time. But it's section 18, verse 10, right? The worth of souls is great in the sight of God. And it's like, but what does that mean? And verse 11 gives the answer because it talks about the suffering Christ. And so the price of redemption teaches us what the value of our souls are. And so for me, when I read your book, I'm like, this is a much more, this is the depth that I've been searching for for years of like, I know I'm worth saving. And by studying the loving Christ, what he suffered, it's evidence. It is evidence all through scripture that he is, he's telling us not only that like he's worth worshiping, but we're worth saving. And that means everything to me. Cause if I'm worth saving, there's probably some things inside of me I don't recognize that he does. Mm. And so that part of it to me, I mean, I, I legitimately, John, I had tears in my eyes reading the chapter about the living versus the loving Christ because it was giving words to a testimony that I haven't been able to fully describe. And all I say to people is, I just know I'm worth saving. But that chapter in the book that where you talk about this is a more, it's like gave me the words to describe my testimony. And that meant everything to me. So that chapter for me was just, it was, that was the heart of the of what I needed from your book, at least at this phase of my life. So thank and you. And I'll be a second oh, witness, you. which That's this beautiful. feels like it would be the closing statement, but we're not done no, yet. No, we're not, no. <laughs> um, that I had the same experience, that I was just so grateful for whatever you have faced to get the book here, because I think one of the cultural teachings of my childhood, the 80s, by the way, <laughs> We could name a few things that were probably skewed a little and, and led to me believing certain things that I've had to maybe reframe for myself. And one of them that maybe traditionally has been taught is that you don't want to sin because you're going to add suffering to Christ. Do you mm -hmm. remember being taught that? Yeah, how many, how many drops of blood mm -hmm. and how stuff? Many and drops and of I understand blood. why that can be resonating, Right. but sometimes it made you feel like... It's not Ashamed. helpful. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. not helpful in, yeah. in fostering a loving connection. And so to, to just add to what Scott has shared is that I felt the Savior with me as I was reading your book. And there's no greater endorsement to draw any anything that draws us closer to Him, but to reframe that studying Gethsemane and the cross and the resurrection, but specifically Gethsemane and the cross, that that should not foster feelings of shame. Hmm. It, it should foster feelings of love. And you talk about that understanding Christ's pain can help us understand why He understands our pain. That's a feeling of love. That's not, that's a bond between the Savior and I. So that when I take the sacrament, I have a more clear understanding of not just the garden, but the pain of the cross. So it's not empty words. So I just want to add the same witness. Why don't we just hijack this interview completely? I have something <laughs> <Yeah>. else. <laughs> well, well, real, real, real quick, while no, we're on no, this. No, no, no. I'm going to go for it. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so part of my current research is looking at what early Latter-day Saint women taught about the crucifixion and the Women's Exponent, the Relief Society magazine. And it's just you're gonna have to stay for part two. <laughs> I know, if you, seriously. If you open that door, we're gonna like full send in it, that. It just resonates with what you just said. In the, I'd have to go back and look at the exact quote, but it's something. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but a woman writes a beautiful poem, and she says, "The place where love does purest burn, is in Calvary." And so this idea of feeling Christ's love and that it's not a shame, but I'm feeling the message of love. It's uh, his work and his glory to yeah. bring to pass, right? It wasn't like he thought, oh, I'm stuck doing this. This, is, this was his why. And if we don't really fully embrace it, it can enable us. Instead, I think many have been taught that we should feel shame by it. Exactly. Do we yeah. want to jump into the temple? Yeah, well, can I, can I read <laughs> okay. my favorite quote from okay. your book to uh, you? You'll love this. <laughs> Everyone loves this. But it goes to the, because it was in this chapter talking about the crucifixion. And anyway, and you just, it, it was really beautiful. It's on page 92 and it says, Christ hung on the cross, not to make us feel bad, but to make us feel good. His death is a tender and personal sacrifice for us, and our acceptance of his sacrifice can be just as tender and personal to him. And man, I loved that. As a relational being that Christ is, more relational than I, I think we even comprehend, but that it means something to him 
when we talk about his loving sacrifice. Like it's, I think he gets emotional at times and is so grateful that we get to glorify the Father as well as him in, in accepting this, this um, and understanding more about his loving sacrifice. So anyway, for me, that was, the, that was like, if I could encapsulate everything that I felt reading this, that would be the quote I would do. Thank you. All right, now we can talk about the temple. Okay, but I also <laughs> wanted to say one more thing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Jennifer Lane, you quote her, and huh? I think she deserves a little shout out because she's head of religious studies right at BYU Hawaii, is that yeah. right? And she said, we can't have one without the other. And as Scott was just talking, I think it's just, it's a marriage, it's an expansion. So if at this point our viewers are like, uh, I'm not sure yet, you know, and you haven't read the book and you're not as enthusiastic as Scott and I are because we've had an opportunity, I think it's about the marriage of lots of ideas, mm -hmm. which is a segue into the temple. Yeah, so let's go into this one. Uh, what relationship, now again, this is your question that you answer in chapter 12. So I figured why reword it? I'll just <laughs> read it, your question back to you. So it's beautifully yeah. worded. So what relationships exist between temple ordinances and Christ's crucifixion? And let me just say, I love that we live in a time of the restoration where I can ask you this question. Yes. You can write about it and we can put it on camera and put it out there. So tell us a little bit about some of the discoveries you had with Christ, crucifixion, and the temple. So what, once you go back to the temple, having the lens of the crucifixion is important, all of a sudden you'll see that it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. The writer of the book of Hebrews talks about how we, pa he, he was referring to the old temple and passing through the veil of the old temple, but now that veil has been torn. And he says, now we enter through a new way that is the flesh of Christ. So for the author of Hebrews, it's the torn flesh of Christ that represents the veil. So you see the veil and anything associated with the veil now is a symbol of the death of Christ, his flesh by which we enter into the celestial kingdom. Or you think about the altar of the temple. Well, if you get down to it, we, we often use the phrase shedding of blood, maybe as a euphemism for Gethsemane, but shedding of blood, it means death. If you look at how the scriptures, how Joseph Smith used the term, it's, it means the death, it's the death of an animal. And so on the altars where blood is shed or animals were slain, think of the central role the altar plays in several different aspects of the temple. One that really stands out to me is the sealing ceremony. Mm -hmm. So whether you think of the altar itself or the bride and groom as they hold hands together on the altar, the crucifixion is literally at the center of a sealing ceremony. It's powerful. So powerful. Do you want to say anything more about that in detail? You talk um, a full chapter about the nail in the sure place. Do you want to expand on the Old Testament connection, which I thought was so beautiful mm -hmm. because it was prophetic. It's predated, right? So anyone in the Old Testament is writing of what's to come. What a powerful testimony, right? Of this is how we are going to know him. You say something so great. I love getting um, the adversary angry on our show. That's <laughs> one of my favorite things to do on Real Talk. And you really call him out. You're like, listen, if the adversary and his team knew that Christ's death was the whole kit and caboodle, right? The whole thing, then they would have been worried about that. And so I think it's interesting that Romans didn't even want to talk about the cross. We better start, right? Because we don't want the adversary to think that we don't know what the ultimate eternal sublime gift was. And if they had known that, then all the prophecies, this is what Christ was going to be known for. And that was the fulfillment. And that's in the Old Testament. And that you, you just kind of quoted Paul. Paul's the one who says that- Well, I if, like to quote Paul. Yeah, it's perfect. You know, <laughs> like that if they would have known it, just like Adam and Eve are tempted by the fruit, well, probably if Satan had known how that was gonna cascade down, he would have scratched that plan. Paul says similar thing with the crucifixion. They would like, why would they have done it? Because it advances God's purpose. Isaiah is the scriptural author of that phrase, nail in the sure place. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of an obscure passage of scripture where he talks about a certain steward in the king's uh, palace. And basically everything hangs on him as a nail in the sure place. And in the book of Revelation, it uses very similar language that connects the servant with Jesus Christ. And so you can see this kind of parallel that Jesus is the nail in the sure place. And there's a, I quote Elder Holland in the book. He has a, an amazing passage. 
in his book on witnesses for his names, where he, he has a chapter on the nail in the shore place. And just basically, that, but the message is just as everything is hanging on the cross, all of our hopes, our fears, our dreams, our worries, they can hang on Jesus Christ. And that is a source of comfort and strength for each of us. Wow. All right, well, let's finish up with one last question. I don't even know where to go from that. Just like everyone just pause. <laughs> okay, let that settle in. So all we wanna do, this is the, the last question that we have for you, and you can answer this however you want as we conclude. But I just want you to fill in the blank. So because of this book, I have. What would you fill in right there um, today as we sit here and, and kind of introduce this um, to the world? Because of this book, I have what? Changed my life. And it sounds strange to say, but studying Christ's death has really changed my life. And I don't know all the ways that I could quantify that, but I'm a little nicer. I think I'm a little bit better father, a little bit better husband. It's hard to, I mean, have you ever been angry with someone while you're thinking about Jesus? No, it's hard, it's hard to do both simultaneously. And studying Christ's crucifixion for me has just centered my thoughts more on Jesus Christ. And you both have brought this up a couple of times, and maybe that's an appropriate way to conclude as well, is that this is not just about the death of Christ or the cross or the crucifixion. It's about Jesus Christ. So should we study more about the crucifixion? Absolutely. Should we study more about the miracles and the parables and his birth and the resurrection? Absolutely. Like, there's so many things that we can focus on with Jesus Christ. And for me, this has been a powerful lens, not the way, but a way to draw closer to Jesus Christ, to center my thoughts more on Him. And I love that when He returns, we will see the scars. There won't be an avoidance of this part of the story. It's a, it's a token and reminder to us of how much He loves us. And thank you for persevering and producing such a beautiful, book that has helped me and I, I know for Scott as well to come closer to Christ. And I love where you started. I, I think it's a good way to end that our testimonies need to be anchored there first. Then policy, doctrine, leadership can come and go and change and it will, right? But that will be the sure place, right? When it's on, our focus is on Christ. So thank you. Thanks Scott for yeah having this conversation. And John, we're just, you always have a seat here. So whenever you want to return, we would love to have more conversations. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have not heard this much nice stuff about me in the past five years. <laughs> I'm going to make my kids watch this episode over Do and it. over and over Do again. Do it. I'm going to make my kids watch it too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us for another episode of Real Talk Friends with John Hilton III. Again, the book that we've been talking about, Considering the Cross, How Calvary Connects Us with Christ. Uh, please check that out. We love you and we'll see you next time.